Hello to your grade 11 students. How are you doing? Last time we did uh, the book Thief up to page 233 up to this point. Uh, when Diesel was uh, having, I think, a, a nightmare in the night, just a few hours later, Liesel awoke and wondered at the height of her heart. She had learned that expression from the dream carrier, uh, which was essentially the complete antithesis of the uh, Whistler, another title. She uh, read a book about an abandoned child who wanted to be a priest. She sat up and sucked deeply at the nighttime air. Weasel came, Papa, what is it? Nothing, Papa, everything's good. But the very moment she had finished the sentence, she saw exactly what had happened in her dream. One small image, for the most part, all is identical. The train moves at the same speed, the usual dream she had. Uh, copiously, her brother coughs the same in the same way. This time, however, Liesel cannot see his face watching the floor. Every time she saw his face while watching the floor. Slowly, she leans over. Her hand lifts him gently from his chin. And there in front of her is the wide-eyed face of Max Vandenberg. It's Max instead of her brother. He stares at her. A feather drops to the floor. The body is bigger now, matching the size of the face. The train screams. Huh? I said, she said again to her father, huh? I said everything is good. Shivering, she was trembling, shivering. She climbed from the mattress, stupid with fear. She walked through the hallway to Max. After many minutes at his side, uh, she was afraid that maybe Max had died. When everything slowed, she attempted to interrupt the dream. Was it a premonition of Max's death when he died? Or was it merely a reaction to the afternoon conversation in the kitchen? Had Max now replaced her brother? And if so, how could she discard her own flesh and blood in such a way? Perhaps it was even a deep-seated wish for Max to die, maybe, after all, if it was good enough for Werner, her brother, it was good enough for this Jew. Is that what you think? She whispered, standing above the bed. No, she could not believe it. Her answer was sustained as the uh, numbness of the dark waned and outlined the various shapes, big and small, on the bedside table, the presence. Wake up, she said. Max did not wake up. For eight more days at school, there was a rapping of knuckles on the door. Come in, called Frau Ollendir, or Ollendrich. Uh, the door opened and the entire classroom of children looked on in surprise to our, as Rosa Hooperman stood in the doorway. So again, Max stayed for eight days uh, 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 like uh, unconscious of what is going on around him, and he was like a dead body lying in, in bed every day for eight days. <coughs> Sorry, Liesel went to school and came back. He was the same. One or two gasped at the sight, students. <coughs> Sorry. A small wardrobe of a woman with a lipstick sneer and chlorine eyes. This was the legend. She was wearing her best clothes, but her hair was a mess. And it was a towel of elastic gray strands. This is Rosa visiting uh, uh, Liesel at school to tell her that Max is uh, uh, still alive. The teacher was obviously afraid, Frau Huberman. Her movements were cluttered. She searched through the class. Liesel, Liesel looked at Trudy, 
stood and walked. What made her mom come to school at that time? Quickly tore the door uh, to end the embarrassment as fast as possible. It shut behind her. And now she was alone in the corridor with Rosa. Rosa faced the other way. What, mama? She turned. Don't you? What, mama? Me? You, little Zalmensch? Liesel was gored by the speed of it. My hairbrush, a trickle of laughter rolled from under the door, but it was drawn instantly back. Mama, her face was severe, but it was smiling. Uh, she, uh, Rosa pretended that she was severe to the girl, but she was smiling, she was happy, but she didn't want to show this because she wanted, or she didn't want anybody to know about Max. What the hell did you do with my hairbrush? You stupid zombie, you little thief. Uh, Rosa wanted uh, the other guys around to know that she came to take her hairbrush, which Lisa took this morning. I've told you a hundred times to leave that thing alone, but do you listen? Of course not. The tirade went on for perhaps another minute. The, the, the fight with Liesel making a desperate suggestion or two about the possible location of uh, the said brush. It ended abruptly with Rosa pulling Liesel close just for a few seconds. Her whisper was almost impossible to hear, even at such close proximity. You told me to, to, to yell at you. You said they'd all believe it. She looked, well, remember that Liesel asked her to come to school and tell her if Max wakes up. Uh, she did what Liesl asked her to do. From her pocket, she pulled out the toy soldier with the scratched exterior. He said to give you this. Max is up again, and he told me to give you this. It was his favorite. She handed it over, held her arms tightly, and smiled. Before Liesl had a chance to answer, she finished it off. Well, answer me. Do you have any other idea where you might have left it? Talking about the hairbrush or the said brush. He's alive, Lisa thought. No, Mama, I'm sorry. Mama, I... Mm, well, what good are you then? She let go, nodded, and walked away to make the others believe that she came for the hairbrush. For a few moments, Lisa thought... Lisa thought the corridor was huge. She examined the soldier in her palm. Uh, instinct told, uh, instinct told, she said to herself, to run home immediately. But common sense, it's not, it's not wise to do this, did not allow it. Instead, she placed the rag soldier, the old soldier, in her pocket and returned to the classroom. Everyone waited. Stupid cow, she whispered under her breath. Uh, again, kids laughed. Frau Olindrich did not. What was that? Liesl was on such a high that she felt indestructible. I said she beamed, stupid cow, and she didn't have to wait a single moment for the teacher's hand to slap her. Don't speak about your mother like that, she said, but it had a little effect. The girl nearly stood there and attempted to hold off the grin. She wanted to smile, but she tried to hold it. After all, she could take a butt chin, a beating, a hide with the best of them. Now get to your seat, the lady said. Yes, Frau Olentrich. Next to her, Rudy dared to speak. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, he whispered. I can see her hand on your face. A big red hand, five fingers. Good, said Lisa, because Max was alive. Hmm. When she made it home that afternoon, he was sitting, this is Max, he was sitting up in bed with the deflated sucker, you know, the deflated sucker, the sucker which was deflated uh, because a truck ran over it. Uh, on his lap, his beard itched him and his swampy eyes put to stay open. An empty bowl of soup was next to the gift. They did not say hello. It was more like edges. The door creaked, the girl came in, and she stood before him, looking at the bowl. Is mama forcing it down your throat? Uh, he nodded, content, fatigue. It was very good, though. Mama soup, really? 
It was not a smile. He gave her, thank you for the presence. More just a slight tear of the mouth. Thank you for the cloud. Your papa explained that one a little further. After an hour, Liesel also made an attempt on the truth. We didn't know what we'd do if you die. Max, we, it didn't take him long. You mean how to get rid of me? Because imagine guys that Max dies in uh, 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 the Hoberman's house or home. Uh, how would they get rid of his body, his corpse? I'm sorry. No, he was not offended. You were right. What if I died? Uh, he played weakly with the ball. You were right to think that way. In your situation, a dead Jew, a dead Jew, not anybody, a Jew, is just as dangerous as a live one. Both are dangerous. So you were hiding him, if not worse. I also dream in detail, she explained it. With the soldier in her grip, she was on the verge of apologizing again when Max intervened. He stopped her. Diesel. He made her look at him. Don't ever apologize to me. It should be me who apologizes to you. He looked at everything she had brought him. She brought him many things. Look at all this. These gifts. He held the button in his hand and Rosa said, you uh, read to me twice every day. Sometimes three times. Now he looked at the curtains as if he could see out of them. He sat up a little higher and paused for a dozen silent sentences. Trepidation found its way onto his face and he made a confession to the girl. Diesel, he moved slightly to the right. I'm afraid, he said, of falling asleep again. He didn't want to fall asleep again because as you see, uh, he sleeps for long days. Liesel was resolute, then I'll read to you and I'll slap your face if you start dozing off. If you start dozing off, if you don't sleep, I'll slap you on the face to wake you up. I'll close the book and shake you till you wake up. That afternoon and well into the night, Liesel read to Max Vandenberg. He sat in bed and absorbed the words awake this time until just after 10 o'clock when Liesel took a quick rest from the dream carrier, the book she's reading now, she looked over the book and Max was asleep. Nervously, she nudged him with it. He awoke. She nudged him with the book. She hit him with the book and he awoke. Another three times he fell asleep. Twice more, she woke him. She kept waking him every time he fell asleep. Uh, for the next four days, he woke up every morning in Liesel's bed. Then next to the fireplace, and eventually by mid-April in the basement, his health had improved, he's okay now, and beard was gone, the beard was gone, and small scraps of weight had returned. Uh, he gained a little weight after losing much weight in the past. In Liesel's inside world, there was great relief at that time outside, things were starting to look shaky. Late in March, a place called Lubeck was hailed with bombs. Next in line would be Cologne, and soon enough, many more German cities, including Munich. Uh, uh, Munich's turn will come uh, for sure. Yes, the boss was at my shoulder. Get it down, get it down. The bombs were coming, and so was I. Death's diary. Uh, this is a diary made by the narrator Dev Cologne. You know, Cologne is a famous German city. The fallen hours of May 30th. I'm uh, sure Liesel Memminger was fast asleep when more than a thousand bomber planes, more than a thousand planes, can you imagine that number, guys? Flew toward a place known as Köln. Uh, for me, the result was five. Uh, this is how it is written in English. And this is how it is written in German. For me, the result was 500 people or thereabouts. I took the souls of about 500, 500 people. 50,000 others uh, ambled homelessly around the ghostly piles of rubble and uh, uh, trying to work out which way was which. 
and which slabs of broken home belong to whom? He didn't know where to go or which uh, 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 homes were theirs and so on. 500 souls. I carry them in my fingers like suitcases or I throw them over my shoulder. It was only the children I carried in my arms. By the time I was finished, the sky was yellow like burning newspaper. If I looked closely, I could see the words, reporting headlines, commentating on the progress of the war and so forth. How, how I, I have loved to pull it all down, to screw up the newspaper sky and toss it away. Uh, my arms ached because I was carrying uh, more than 500 souls and I couldn't afford to burn my fingers. There was still so much work to be done. As you might expect, many people died instantly. Others took a while longer. There were several more places to go, skies to meet and souls to collect. And when I came back to Colony later on, uh, no, not longer after the final planes, I managed to notice a most unique thing. What's it? I was carrying the charred soul of a teenager. When I looked gravely, sadly, up at what? was now a sulfuric sky, the sky is sulfuric now. Uh, a, a group of 10 year old girls was close by. One of them called down, what's that? Her arm extended and her finger pointed out the black, slow object falling from above. It began as a black feather. She saw something that's black falling from above like a black feather Lilting, floating, uh, a black feather lilting and floating in the air, or a piece of ash. Then it grew larger, it became larger and larger. The same girl, a redhead with uh, uh, period freckles, uh, spoke once again, this time more emphatic, emphatic, emphatically, sorry. What is that? The, the, the bomb was coming nearer and nearer. It's a body, another girl suggested. Black hair, pigtails, and crooked part down the center. It's another bomb, they shouted. It was too slow to be a bomb, okay? Uh, with the adolescent spirit still burning lightly in my arms, I walked a few hundred meters with the rest of them, uh, with the girls, like the girls. I remained focused on the sky. The last thing I wanted was to look down at the stranded face of my teenager, a pretty girl, her whole death was now ahead of her. She was looking at the uh, bomb falling down, thinking that it was a feather at the beginning, and then she realized it was a bomb, and then she died. Like the rest of them, I was taken aback when a voice flung out. Uh, it was a disgruntled father ordering his kids inside. The redhead reacted. Her freckles uh, lengthened into commas, but Papa looked. Uh, the man took several small steps and soon figured out what it was. It's the fuel, he said. What do you mean? The fuel, he repeated, the tank. He was a bold man in disrupted bed clothes. Uh, they used up all their fuel in that one and got rid of the empty container. So it was a fuel container. Look, there's another one over there. And the kids being kids, they all searched frantically and at, at the point or at that point, trying to find an empty fuel container floating to the ground. The first one landed with a hollow cut. It made a hollow in the ground. Uh, can we keep it, Papa? No, he was bummed and shocked. This Papa and clearly not in the mood. We cannot keep it. He was nervous because he was bumped and shocked. Why not? I'm going to ask my papa if I can have it, said another of the girls. Me too. Just past the rubble of or the rubble of colony, a group of kids collected empty fuel containers, uh, dropped by their enemies. As usual, I collected humans. I was tired, and the year wasn't even halfway over yet. It was in May, as we said. Uh, then we have the visitor, 
a new ball had been found for Hemel Street soccer. Uh, the one, the, the, the previous one was deflated under the truck. Uh, that was the good news. Uh, the somewhat unsettling news was that a division of the NSDAP was heading toward them. Uh, a division of the Hitler boys or you. They progressed all the way through Malkin, street by street, house by house, and now they stood at Frau Diller's shop, having a quick smoke before they continued with their business. There was already a smattering of air raid sheltering in Malkin, but it was decided soon after the bombing of Cologne that a few more certainly wouldn't hurt. The NSDAP was inspecting each and every house, looking for in order to see if its basement was a good enough candidate. Okay, uh, for example, because the uh, town uh, is expected to be bombarded soon, uh, but they went to make sure that the basements were good enough for those people to hide. From afar, the children watched. They could see the smoke rising out of the pack. They were smoking. Liesel had only just come out and she walked over to Rudy and Tommy. Harold Mollenhauer was retrieving the ball. What's going on up there? Rudy put his hands in his pockets. The party, the group, he inspected his friend's progress with the ball in Frau uh, Holsepfeld's front hedge. They're checking all the houses and apartment blocks. Instant dryness seized the interior of Liesel's mouth. For what? Max is hiding down there. Don't you know anything? Tell her, Tommy. Tommy was perplexed. He was confused. Well, I don't know. You're hopeless. The pair of you. They need more air raid shelters. If a plane raids or, or, or bombards us, we will find shelter. shelter. What basements? No, attics, of course, basements. Uh, Jesus, Lisa, he's looking sarcastically. You really are thick. You really are dumb, aren't you? The ball was back. Rudy, he played onto it, and Lisa was still standing. How could she get back inside without looking too suspicious? And she was playing with them. She wanted to go back home to warn uh, uh, Rosa and, and, and Hans that the guys are coming to check the basement. And Max is uh, lying down there. The smoke up at crowd dealers was disappearing, and the small crowd of men was starting to disperse. Panic generated in the awful way she had, so she had to think quickly. Throat and mouth, air became sad or sand. Think, she thought, come on, he's a think, think, huh? What can I do to go home now? Rudy scored. Far away voices congratulated him. Uh, think, Liesel. Uh, she's thinking what to do. How can she leave this group without letting them know uh, why? She had it. That's it. She decided, but I have to make it real. As the Nazis progress down the street, uh, painting the letters LSR on some of the doors, the ball was passed through the air to one of the bigger kids, Klaus Berig. LSR, Luft, Schutz, Raum, which means air raid shelter. Luft in German, I think, means air, and Raum, maybe like a shelter or something. Luft, Schutz, Raum. The boy turned with the hole just at Liesel, uh, as Liesel arrived, and they collided with such force that the game stopped automatically. They fell on the ground. As the ball rolled off, players ran in. Liesel held her grazed knee, she grazed her knee on purpose with one hand and her head. With the other, Klaus Berg only held his right shin, grimacing and cursing her. Where, where is she? She spat, um, or he spat, sorry, I'm going to kill her because she collided into him and hurt him. There would be no killing. It was worse. Uh, her injury was worse. A kindly party member had seen 
the incident and jog beautifully down to the group. What happened here? He asked. Well, she's a maniac. Klaus pointed at, at she's crazy at Hazel, prompting the man to help her up. His tobacco breath formed a smoky sandhill in front of her face. I don't think you're in my state to keep playing, my girl, he said. Where do you live? Uh, I'm fine. I'm fine. She answered, really, I can't make it myself. Just get off me. Get off me. She said to the man. That was when Rudy stepped in, the eternal stepper inner. He was the eternal stepper inner. He was there anytime she needed help. I'll help you home, she, he said. Why couldn't he just mind his own business for a change? Uh, really, Liesl said, just keep playing, Rudy. I can make it. Thank you, Rudy. No, no, he wouldn't be shifted. He wouldn't change his mind. The stubbornness of him, I'll only take a minute or two. Again, she had to think. And again, she was able, with Rudy holding her up, she made herself drop once more to the ground on her back. My papa, she said, the sky she noticed was utterly blue. Not even the suggestion of a cloud. Could you get him, Rudy? Could you get my papa? Uh, stay there. To his right, he called out, Tommy, watch her, will you? Don't let her move. She wanted to send him away because she didn't want him to go with her home. Tommy snapped into action. I watched her, Rudy. He stood about her uh, or above her, twitching and trying not to smile as Liesl kept an eye on the party man. A minute later, Hans Huberman was standing calmly above her. Hey, Papa. Ah, uh, her Papa, she sent for her Papa to come and take care himself. A disappointed smile mingled with his lips. I was wondering when this would happen. I waited this. Uh, uh, he picked her up and helped her home. The game went on. And the Nazi was already at the door of a lodging a few doors up. No one answered. Rudy was calling out again. Do you need help, Herr Huberman? Uh, no, no. Uh, you keep playing, Herr Steiner, Mr. Steiner. And you uh, had to love Liesel's papa. Uh, once inside, Liesel gave him the information. She attempted to find the middle ground between silence and despair, papa. Don't talk. The party, she whispered. Uh, they are here. Papa stopped. He fought off the urge to open the door and look up the street. They're checking basements to make shelter. He set her down. Smart girl, he said. Then called for Rosa. She warned him. They had a minute to come up with a plan. As she mots so of thoughts. As she mots so of thoughts. Uh, many thoughts. Well, just put him in Liesel's room was Mama's suggestion under the bed. That's it. What if they decide to search our rooms as well? Uh, Hans asked, do you have a better plan? Correction, they did not have a minute. A seven punch knock was hammered into the door of 33 Hemel Street and it was too late to move anyone anywhere. Uh, the boys open up. Their heartbeats fought each other. A mess of rhythm inside their chests. Liesel tried to eat hers down. The taste of heart was not too cheerful. Uh, Rosa whispered, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. On this day, it was Papa who rose to the occasion. He rushed to the basement door and threw a warning down the steps. When he returned, he spoke fast and fluent. Look, there's no time for tricks. We could distract him a hundred different ways, but there is only one solution. He eyed the door and summed up. Nothing. That was not the answer Rosa wanted. He, her eyes widened. Nothing. Are you crazy? The knocking resumed. Papa was tricked. Nothing. We don't even go down there. Not a care in the world. We'll let him go or, or, or not maybe. Uh, uh, everything's closed. Rosa accepted it, clenched with distress. 
She shook her head and, processed or, and proceeded to answer the door. Liesl, Papa's voice sliced her up. Just stay calm. Vishtir, do you understand? Yes, Papa. Uh, she tried to concentrate on her bleeding leg. Uh -huh. At the door, Rosa was still asking the meaning of this interruption when the kindly party man noticed Liesl. He looked at the girl with her bleeding knee. Uh, the many killed soccer player, he grinned. He saw her outside. Remember, how the knee, you don't usually imagine that. Hats is being too chirpy, but this man certainly was. Uh, he was kind. He came in and made all of, uh, uh, all, uh, sorry, made as if to crouch and view the injury. Does he know, Hazel thought? Can he smell we're hiding a Jew? She asked herself. Papa came from the sink with a wet cloth and soaked it onto Lisa's knee. Does it sting? Does it hurt? His silver eyes were caring and calm. The scare in them could easily be mistaken as concern for the injury. Rosa called across the kitchen. I, it can't sting enough. Maybe it will teach her a lesson. She deserves it because she's like a tomboy. Uh, a girl who acts like a boy. She's playing soccer with gold. The party man stood and laughed. I don't think this girl is learning any lessons out there. Frau, she said, uh, uh, Rosa said, answered Hoberman. The cardboard contorted. She answered him. Frau Hoberman, I think she teaches lessons. He handed Liesel a smile to all those boys. Am I right, young girl? Nobody of these young children learns his or her lesson. Papa shoved, pushed the cloth into the grace and Liesel went rather than answered. Uh, it was Hans who spoke a quiet sorry to the girl. There was a discomfort of silence then. The man has to do his job. He came to look uh, uh, in the basement to see whether it was suitable for hiding or not. And the party man remembered his purpose. I'm here to do this. If you don't mind, he explained, I need to inspect your basement. I need to check it just for a minute or two to see if it's suitable or a suitable place for a, a shelter. Papa gave Lisa's knee a final dab. You'll have a nice bruise there too, Lisa. Casually, he acknowledged the man above them. Certainly, first door on the right. He said, first door on the right, enjoy. Please excuse the mess. Uh, I wouldn't worry. It can't be worse than some of others I have seen today. This one, that's it. Yes, the man went down the longest three minutes in their life in Hoberman history. Papa sat at the table. Rosa prayed in the corner, mouthing the words. Liesel was cooked. Her knee, her chest, her muscles, and the arms. I doubt any of them, this is death, had the audacity the bravery to consider what they do if the basement was appointed as a shelter. They had to survive the inspection first. They didn't care about the being bombed or not. They cared about the inspection and then uh, uh, they can think about the shelter. They listened to Nazi footsteps in the basement. There was the sound of measuring tape. They were measuring something. Liesel could not Word of the thought of Max sitting beneath the steps, huddled around his uh, sketchbook, hugging it to his chest. Papa stood, another idea. He walked to the hall and called down. Everything got down there. The answer ascended the steps on top of Max Vandenberg. Another minute, perhaps. We need another minute here. Would you like some coffee, some tea? Uh, 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 this. Hans was trying to, uh, let's say, uh, distract them. No, thank you. When Papa returned, he ordered Liesel to fetch a book and for Rosa to start cooking. He decided the last thing they should do was sit around looking bored. Well, come on. He said loudly, move it, Liesel. I don't care if your knee hurts. You have to finish that book, like you said. Liesel tried not to break. Yes, Papa. What are you waiting for? It took great effort to wink at her. She could tell. 
in the corridor, she nearly collided with the party man in trouble with your papa. Huh? You are in trouble also with your papa. Never mind. I'm the same with my own children. They walk their separate ways, and when Liesel made it to her room, she closed the door and fell to her knees. Despite the added pain, she listened first to the judgment that the basement was too shallow, then the goodbyes, one of which was sent down the corridor with my maniacal soccer player, you girl who is crazy about soccer. She remembered herself, Auf Wiedersehen, or goodbye. The dream carrier, the title of the book in her hand, simmered in her hand, was like boiling, was very hot. According to Papa, Rosa melted next to the stove. The moment the party man was gone, they collected Liesel and made their way to the basement, removing the well-placed drop sheets and paint cans. Max Vandenberg sat beneath the steps, holding his rusty scissors like a knife to defend himself. His armpits were soggy and the words fell like injuries from his mouth. I wouldn't have used them. I wouldn't have used these scissors to kill anybody, he quietly said. Um, he held the rusty arms flat against his forehead. I'm so sorry I put you through that. I'm so sorry I caused that to you. Papa lit a cigarette. Rosa took the scissors. You're alive, she said. We all are alive. It was too late now for apologies. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Next time we'll start at this part. And remember, guys, you have to finish up to the end of part seven this uh, uh, term, inshallah. See you. Assalamu alaikum.